Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast, dedicated to the Holy Family. I'm Thomas V. Miras. Today I'm talking to Father Roger Landry about the sexual abuse crisis in the Catholic Church today. Hey everyone, my guest today, Father Roger Landry, is a priest of the Diocese of Fall River, Massachusetts. He's also the author of a recent book from Pauline Books called Plan of Life, Habits to Help You Grow Closer to God, uh, which has apparently been very successful, which doesn't surprise me at all because he's one of the best preachers that I've heard. In the weeks following the revelations about McCarrick's abuse and the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, Father Roger has written some articles for the National Catholic Register, which I found to be the most edifying thing that I've read on the Catholic sex abuse crisis in recent months. And you can find the links to those articles at catholicculture.org slash episode 19. In this episode, we have a great conversation about the nature of the sex abuse crisis and some of the spiritual problems in the church that have allowed this to happen and allowed it to continue to go unaddressed. And then in November, I'm going to have him on again to talk about how the laity can respond to the crisis. Topics covered in today's episode include what has and hasn't been improved since 2002 in the church's handling of this issue, the stages of McCarrick's rise in the hierarchy and how he was able to do so, the connections between doctrinal infidelity and infidelity of other sorts, the mindset and the rationalizations used by priests to live double lives, and the issue of clericalism and whether this is really, as many are saying, the main problem behind the sexual abuse crisis. It is a very illuminating conversation, and it helped me to answer some of my personal questions about certain subcultures within the priesthood. So I'm sure you will benefit from what Father Roger has to say. Father Roger Landry, welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Good to be with you, Thomas. Maybe we can start today's episode with just an overview of what has changed since the last wave of scandals, I guess a decade and a half ago now, what has been improved and what hasn't been improved. Much has changed. First, the entire church has gone through this before. So there's greater experience the second time around, but there's also a shorter fuse. There was a lot of trust given 16 years ago, and if that trust hasn't proven what was necessary in order to be able to get the real reform at its roots, people are just, they have a quicker fuse in terms of expressing their righteous indignation, I think, today. Back in 2002, the main aspect of the scandal that was looked at was priests who were wolves in shepherd's clothing rather than people serving those for whom Christ had died and whom he had entrusted to them. And so the real emphasis was to rid the priesthood of anyone who would harm the young. What happened in Dallas when the U.S. bishops got together in 2002 is they hastily put together policy that for to a large degree has done what it was intended to do in making sure that there's no toleration in the church for those who abuse young people. So the procedures for the most part have worked. Most of the cases that still come forward today are cases prior to 2002. For example, the Pennsylvania Grand Jury in their huge report over the course of the summer was mainly concerning cases that happened prior to the reforms of 2002. There's no way to eliminate every last abuse of young people unfortunately. But it has gone a long way to eliminate what was epidemic to something that's absolutely sporadic. At the same time, what we've seen is when the bishops met in Dallas in June of 2002, there were a few problems with what they put together. First, they had an exceedingly vague definition of what a credible accusation is, one that put a lot of priests at risk because a credible accusation was just something that possibly could have occurred. And priests would have very limited time to leave their rectory. A lot of the time, statements would be put on out that made people think that they were guilty before they had a chance to have their own side heard, etc. And so it led to a big issue with priests being falsely accused and also an antagonistic relationship between bishops 
bishops and their priests that were no longer father-son, but a little bit more like liaison of the DA and somebody who would be accused. And so that was one issue. The second issue is the bishops had exempted themselves from the policy in 2002. That needed to be cleared up. The third was that they they didn't really address the what the data showed the crisis was about. 81% of the accusations between 1950 and 2002 were with post with boys and more than 7 out of 10 of those were with post pubescent boys. There was a crisis of what we would call homosexual molestation of uh, young adult boys who are, were post puberty, not a pedophilia crisis, which was always referring to prepubescent boys. And so that just wasn't candidly stated, mainly because of its overlap with homosexual predation in general. And then the fourth case there is there was no real attempt to look at the culture that would rob most clerics of the type of horror they should have before the sacrilege of priests cheating on their vocations, period. I have made the claim that one of the reasons why the clergy sex abuse crisis was able to get as bad as it was, was because many in the church had become habituated to hearing truthful accusations that a priest was having an affair with a woman, a priest was regularly engaging in sexual activity with someone of the same sex, etc. And if you lose the horror for higher incidence rates of those types of sins with adults, it made it easier for sins with 17-year-olds and 16-year-olds and 15-year-olds to happen. And so that was 2002. 2018, this crisis is mainly about the lack of trust in bishops who had exempted themselves in 2002 and hadn't done everything that they needed to to police their own. If they weren't going to be under the Dallas Charter, there was the expectation that if they knew that one of their fo fellow bishops was sinning in this type of way, that they would take matters in their own hand because they know how damaging it is, both at the level of what we would call malfeasance, not ridding the priesthood of priests who are harming rather than helping, but also with regard to their own conduct, if they themselves were cheating on their vocation one way or the other. And as we saw in the Cardinal McCarrick episode, the former Cardinal McCarrick, that was just not being done. And so along the way, many who had heard rumors were just not doing what they needed to in terms of fraternal correction and working with the Holy Father and the Holy Father's organs over in the Vatican to make sure that these types of scandalous behaviors that were sacrilegious and sinful were extirpated from the priesthood. That was issue number one. Two, we've seen in the Cardinal McCarra case that what should have been done in 2002 wasn't, that there is a connection between homosexual sins and sacrilegious crimes against minors. Cardinal McCarrick was guilty of both. And so any attempt to deny that these two sinful patterns that you've seen in the clergy have nothing have, have nothing to do with each other, that's been proven false in McCarrick's case. And it also leads to the larger issue that wasn't solved 16 years ago of what to do about the culture in which people expect their priest to be holy, people expect their priest rightly to keep the Ten Commandments, to keep their promises for diocesan priests or vows for religious priests of chaste celibacy faithfully. And when there's a culture in which there's a don't ask, don't tell with regard to a lot of that sinful misbehavior, it just sucks the spiritual wind out of a lot of lay people as precisely it should. And for the priests who are really trying to be faithful, they'll often say that one of the biggest challenges in the priesthood is trying to fix the damage caused by the scandalous behavior of brother priest. And so that's all come to the surface in, uh, surface in 2018. And so I'd say two things in general. One, people are hurt more because they gave people a chance in the church to fix the problem the first time. And now the damage to their trust is more severe. But on the other hand, I think this time the excuses of 16 years ago are no longer able to be used when they're trying to deny that there are other aspects of the crisis that have to be addressed. And as painful as it is to see all this filth come up to the surface, we are one step closer to 
remedying the problem than we were when it was still under the surface. So as hard as it is to embrace the reality of what's before our eyes right now, it is one step closer to the solution, which is a holy, faithful priesthood and a holy, faithful church in which we believe all aspects of the good news, especially the teachings with regard to human sexuality, that we're called to live chastely no matter what our state of life is. Do the revelations of 2018, particularly things like the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, do they show that anything had changed for the better as far as things like the Dallas Charter? So it demonstrates quite clearly the huge drop off in accusations, not just accusations in general, not to mention credible and substantiated ones after 2002. The vast majority of the cases that were given to us between 1946 and 2014 in the Dallas Charters, if my memory served me correctly, but I might be confusing with the dates of the latest report in Germany. But that most of the, the vast majority of the cases were prior to 2002. So after 2002, it wasn't that abuse cases were occurring but not being reported, but they just weren't being, they weren't happening, which is why we had so fewer cases. Because after 2002, there's it's it's much easier for people to come forward. They know that these cases will be taken seriously. And so Pope Francis, even in his letter, and in a press conference mentioned that as painful as it is to see the history of abuse and the real sort of debauched type of evil that was taking place in some of these rings of homosexual predation, for example, in the Diocese of Pittsburgh, what it shows, the slight little glimmer of hope, is that after 2002, the policies that were adopted have, to a large degree, dramatically limited the amount of new cases, thanks be to God. What we also saw in that report was it was almost parallel to what we saw in the John Jay study after the 2002 scandals, which almost the exact same percentages of abuse on postpubescent boys, which is much closer to homosexual predation than it would be to pedophilia. And so it's one more example of what the church has to confront honestly if we're really going to eradicate the crisis of homosexual attacks and molestation on boys. We have to address the culture of homosexuality in the priesthood. You mentioned, uh, you made a distinction between accusations and accusations that have been substantiated. And I'm sort of curious about this. And and people, I don't, I don't think people in the church are really being quick to talk about this so much because I think they are less ready to to be defensive than they were uh, in the last wave of scandals. But do we have any sense of how many of the accusations are actually, you know, true? So in the cases that were part of the John Jay report, the vast majority of people who had come forward had been abused. A lot of the times they can't forgive God for allowing them to have been abused. And so sometimes though they've got every behavioral trait that would be consistent with somebody who has been abused, a lot of the times it wasn't the priest who had actually abused, but they were blaming it to God and associating it basically with the church. What was the incidence rate of that? In Among the false accusations against clergy, most of the false accusers had actually been abused by somebody else. Okay. But what is the percentage of false accusations against clergy? It's relatively speaking small less than 10%. We can never know for sure if we weren't there, whether it was true or false in every case. But the amount of people coming forward, making an accusation up against clergy is was demonstrated to be relatively speaking small when you look at whether the evidence seems plausible or not, whether the priest actually admitted to it, whether there were multiple accusers. If there are multiple accusers of the same priest, his denials don't take on the same ring, etc. So it was relatively speaking small. But we likewise do have to prevent the repetition of similar mistakes to what had occurred prior to 2002 with victims. So prior to 2002, 
the priest's word of denial was almost taken for granted, and the one who had been abused, that person's word was not taken seriously enough. There was a real frenzy that had come forward, etc. So we need to make sure that we try to get to the truth of things because we don't want to automatically take a putative victim's word as odd as de facto truth right. before it's really been investigated because there have been some priests in which the accusations were clearly false. We likewise see it in church history. We saw it in communist lands that mm. it was one of the techniques of communist apparatchiks that if they couldn't actually catch a priest in sin – by sending people to seduce of one way or another. Often they just start rumors and make false accusations. And so we just want to make sure that we get to the truth of matters. But for the most part, the church in her practices, if somebody comes forward with an accusation that could have happened, the church veers on the side of immediately removing a priest after a preliminary investigation to uh, hand it over to professionals who can investigate it further to see if it's plausible enough that this priest needs to be removed from the priesthood. And so false accusations are few, but they do happen. And so we need to have protocols so that like injustice civilly and ecclesiastically across the century, that we don't presume somebody is guilty before he's had his side of the story heard. Now, as far as bishops are concerned, is there presently a place that people can go with an accusation against a bishop? Sure, there are. The U.S. bishops back in 2002 said that it could happen to the Metropolitan Archbishop, for example. So if you're here in the Archdiocese of New York, he is the Metropolitan Archbishop, and there are lots of what we call suffragan sees. So the Diocese of Brooklyn, all the Diocese of New York, essentially, would in canonical matters be under the Metropolitan See of New York. If it were against, for example, the Metropolitan Archbishop, then it could go to the nuncio. The faithful are always able to bring things to the papal nuncio in, in Washington. They're always able to bring it directly to the Congregation for Bishops in the Vatican. They're always able to write directly to Pope Francis himself. And these types of accusations aren't buried. They are taken seriously when they come in, when somebody's actually signed a letter. And uh, it seems to be very much of clear mind, then these are taken seriously today. We need something better than that. That's always existed. And so the U.S. bishops in their meetings in November have proposed that to set up an independent reporting board so that if there are any accusations against bishops, first with minors and then other types of sexual misconduct with adults, that there would be a clear place where people would be able to go and give present their accusations in a way in which their identity would be likewise protected so that there wouldn't be able to be retaliation if that is a fear that they would have. And so we've got to beef up that system. The U.S. bishops in what they've announced from their administrative committee in anticipation of the November meeting seem to have gotten that very clearly. If that passes... Uh, and then it's approved by Rome, it would be a major step forward to hold bishops accountable because the bishops recognize that in order to reestablish trust, they must be held accountable. Are we talking about a lay board here? So it's going to be lay driven for sure. When we start to work out the details, we'll see, for example, if there'll be an Episcopal advisor to it, not somebody who can ever show it down. But some of the times, lay people do need some help in terms of how things work ecclesiastically sure, and the rest sure. to be able to answer questions. And so the nitty gritty hasn't been announced, but it's going to be a lay dominated board, and we'll see exactly what type of liaison they would be with the bishops. But this is a thing in which it's clear to the bishops and clear to everybody else that it can't be controlled by the bishops because at this point, they're just not trusted to police themselves. In one of your articles, you talked about how basically Cardinal McCarrick's problems were overlooked at multiple stages of the process as he was promoted to various positions. What kinds of reforms to the process of selecting bishops are required? So former Cardinal McCarrick was a priest of the Archdiocese of New York. He was the secretary for the Cardinal Archbishop of New York, Cardinal Cook. 
when a cardinal archbishop wants one of his priests to become an auxiliary bishop, he basically is the one who controls most of the process. He puts together the ranked list of three names that would go to the nuncio and through the nuncio to the congregation for bishops and ultimately through them to the pope. They don't consult broadly on auxiliary bishops if a person's been a secretary to a, a cardinal, the ones who get the background check letters from the nuncio, those would more or less be others in the chancery. So if there are problems being overlooked in the chancery, that's not really going to be discovered. A contrary path, let's just say a person was a parish priest who had lived in four different parish situations. Normally, all the priests who would have lived with him would get letters just saying, "Have uh, how has this person lived the priesthood? How did he preach the gospel? Was he always faithful? Did he have any alcohol problems? Did he have any moral problems? All of these things have a chance to be discovered much more easily when people have lived in multiple places than just with the one who is essentially nominating him. And so Cardinal Cook was able to get former Cardinal McCarrick made an auxiliary bishop. That would have been the first step of the process. We can look there. Hopefully, we will be able to discover what was known at that time period. There were multiple rumors, still are in New York, that when Cardinal McCarrick used to go up to Dunwoody Seminary, they used to hide the tall, thin, handsome ones, more or less from him, because he had a reputation at that point. There are conversations that pass among the priests in New York that one time he was caught in the hospital, having been beaten up after frequenting a situation of a gay bar. And that was brought to the attention of the cardinal at the time. I can't independently verify that, but I trust the priests who have told me that they heard that from the one who had received the phone call. Mm. So there were facts at the time. But in the 1970s, likewise in the 1960s, a lot of sexual sins were treated the way we treat in the church a priest with an alcohol problem that it's basically a moral problem in which somebody doesn't have the ability to say stop. And so what do we do for priests who are alcoholics? We send them away to a treatment center, let them go through the process of withdrawal, get them some counseling to address the issues that lead them to drink in an abusive way. And we've seen some priests who have been alcohol abusers before be able to return to ministry humble really good confessors, never drink another drop in their life. And a lot of the times we treated far more serious moral problems by the same standard, ultimately because we were caring more for the priest and his rehabilitation than we were for those people he could hurt. The abuse of minors was much more similar to an alcoholic priest regularly getting behind the wheel and going out and killing people. And if a priest repeatedly did that... That's the way it should have been treated right. with regard to the abuse situation. And so for whatever reason, what everybody else seemed to know with the smoke with regard to some of father and Monsignor Theodore McCarrick's behavior was overlooked and he was made an auxiliary. And then Metuchen, the a new diocese was being formed, Cardinal in the United States can always nominate priests for Turnus. I have to say, Cardinal McCarrick is a very, very gifted priest administratively. He was one of the greatest fundraisers in the history of the church in the United States. He administratively totally reformed in a very good way Seton Hall. He was a vocations magnet. There would have been multiple reasons. He was an excellent preacher. When he used to come to the North American College in the 1990s, when bishops would be there celebrating mass in the morning, oftentimes they'd be asked to preach. And we would be exposed as seminarians over there to basically all the bishops who were preaching. McCarrick was the best when he came through. We always wanted to listen to him. He was down to earth. He always had a clear point. He was funny, but he packed a punch every time that he said it. So here was a man who was very impressive in a lot of the things that you'd look for, but now we clearly know he was unfaithful behind the scenes. But So when Metuchen opens up as a new diocese, it's not a shocker for people just looking at the gifts that God had given him that he would be chosen for there, but we know now that he was abusing his office there to go down to a beach apartment and take seminarians with him and play a game of musical beds like musical chairs in which there'd be one too few so that he could do weird stuff like try to cuddle with seminarians in his bed. Next turn is happening for Archdiocese of Newark, which is the next period. And again, none of this stuff which was happening was decisive 
in terms of whether it was known or whether it was taken seriously as to whether he would become the Archbishop in Newark. And then it was Washington, D.C. And so whatever went into that appointment, if you look at what was revealed in Archbishop Vigano's letter that hasn't been contradicted, we'll see if it actually gets verified that Archbishop Theodore McCarrick was 14th on the Turner, the rank list of three names for Washington. The Most Turners don't get 14 names on it. A person is ranked 14th so that everybody knows that he wasn't fourth. He wasn't fifth. He wasn't anywhere close to being one of the candidates who would be recommended for Washington, and yet leapfrogged all 13 people ahead in order to be appointed the Archbishop of Washington. And so there were four different stages when he became auxiliary in New York, when he became Bishop of Matachi, when he became Archbishop of Newark, and when he became Archbishop of Washington, not to mention nominated for the honorific of Cardinal, that the system failed to find out that this was a person who had been abusing even the first boy he had ever baptized, because we weren't asking the questions of the people who would have known the information. And so that whole process of the selection of bishops needs to be reformed. I think one of the real weaknesses is once somebody already is a bishop, they don't do the same thorough background check that happens when someone's named a bishop for the first time. And, you know, if every time a person, for example, in the U.S. government is going to be appointed to a cabinet level position, for example, there's a thorough background check by the FBI. We don't have an FBI, but we have lots of ex-FBI agents and everything else like this. And I just think for due diligence, because the position is so important that we should do that. When I was applying to seminary, I had to pay out of my own pocket for an AIDS test. Now, I could guarantee to my doctor that there was zero chance I had AIDS because they had never engaged in any of the behavior through which one would get AIDS, even in receiving a blood transfusion. Mm. It had never happened in my life. I was 100% certain I did not have HIV, but nevertheless, I had to go through the humiliating process of getting a test anyway because the church needed to know with regard to healthcare things and everything else, as well as old lifestyle sort of circumstances that I wasn't going to be entering seminary and entering the priesthood with a potentially fatal disease. If they make seminarians take AIDS tests, we can have church uh, those who are up for higher office in the church have a thorough background check. So just as a point of information, you mentioned McKirk being a great preacher. Was he an outwardly orthodox bishop? He was not an outwardly heterodox bishop. And so okay. I don't mean to parse words there. Sure. He would give no flags in saying anything that would be contrary to church teaching. Okay. There were always certain emphases in his priesthood that he would have in which, you know, he would regularly be preaching about care for the poor. That's no problem. Everybody should be preaching about care for the poor. He would have what most who would know the terminology would be able to describe as social justice issues would be his sort of priority in preaching when he would talk about it. But it was always linked to Jesus Christ. Right. It was always linked to the tradition of the church. It was always sort of summoning us to take seriously the gift of our priesthood and our preparation for serving the people of God. You know, when he preached, he preached as a combination of of a grandfather with high expectations and also somebody who would be an inspiring coach. And so his message always had a certain certain immediacy. He was never boring us. He was looking us straight in the eyes and challenging us to live up to Christ's call in one sense or another. And so he knew his audience very well, and he was able to preach it. I think that that's likewise one of the reasons why he had such a great record everywhere he was in encouraging men to pursue the priesthood, because he did have that type of capacity to understand his audience and speak in categories that would move. So he was social justice oriented, but he wasn't necessarily using the sorts of sorts of jargon that one might expect from, say, a Cupich or something like well, that. Well, without necessarily comparing to anybody else, you know, okay. the some people who preach a social justice message won't ever really mention Jesus. 
or only sort of as an accident. I remember once going to a cardinal who was very well known for a social justice message, preaching the Red Mass in Washington, D.C., in the presence of, for example, Supreme Court justices and the whole legal establishment. And in a 22-minute homily, he didn't mention Jesus or God once. He was just talking about social justice principles, which could have come, for example, straight out of the Democratic platform. Right. There's a different aspect in which you're tying everything into the immediate summons of Jesus. Right. We can argue, everybody can argue in the church of whether, you know, what the role of government is in, for example, caring for the poor. What's not opinable for a faithful Catholic is whether we have to care for the poor. Right. The methodology is different. And so there's a huge difference between those like Cardinal McCarrick, who always tied it back to Jesus, and the others who would more or less talk in political ways without evangelical cores. Okay. The reason I ask about that is because I wanted to discuss the relationship between doctrinal infidelity and and these other types of infidelities that we're discussing. And I, I'm well aware that an outwardly orthodox or even a, a truly orthodox bishop could be could fail us in terms of properly disciplining, you know, priests who have has have misbehaved in various ways, obviously. But I've also and and of course an outwardly orthodox priest can be an abuser and things like that. But I've wondered to what degree there is a connection between these doctrinal infidelities and sexual abuse. I guess from my own perspective, and this just may be biased, but this whole thing in recent months has really made me think more about the relationship between those things. And to me, you know, this sexual abuse crisis is is only one part of an overall crisis in the church. And, you know, people have talked about, you, you talked in one of your articles about some people having trouble trusting their priests now. I wouldn't say that I distrust priests in general anymore, but I would say that I I trust less that a priest who is either unwilling to preach the gospel or undermining the gospel in various ways I trust less that he's going to be keeping his vows. You know, I don't I don't assume that that means he's a predator of some kind, but do you, you know what I'm saying there? I do. I'd make various distinctions. So the first distinction is orthodoxy, believing the right things, speaking the right things that we believe isn't able to be equated with holiness. Of course. St. Paul himself experiences, he writes about in Romans 7, that the good he wanted to do, he didn't do. The evil he wanted to avoid, he always wasn't successful in avoiding. No, he wasn't committing serious sins, mortal sins as far as we would know, but but there's always that struggle of aligning our life totally to the summons to holiness that the Lord calls us in big things and in small. If someone likewise is heterodox in his teaching, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's immoral in his practice. He can be kind and he can be good. A lot of the heretics, for example, have been personally very ascetic, and that might have contributed a little bit to their becoming more and more calcified Mm. in their asceticism. I like to approach it from the other perspective. If somebody is not practicing what the church teaches, a lot of the times he begins to preach what he fails to practice. Mm. So, for example, when I hear that a priest is preaching you know, not just not defending church teaching, but preaching contrary to clear teaching. The odds in my own mind that he's not walking the walk are pretty high. So if somebody comes to tell me that a priest was preaching in favor of contraception, in favor of homosexual activity, saying that the church is all hung up when it talks about chastity and it's unrealistic to where people are. The odds that that person is not walking the walk in my book are pretty high, are pretty high, unfortunately. And I've seen that happen enough that, you know, when when people have been proven to be immoral after having taught in heterodox ways, that that working assumption is valid in a lot of circumstances. There are many exceptions to all of that. So I wouldn't want people necessarily to say that because someone doesn't preach effectively or sometimes preaches in a confused way that they know by their own study of the church is not lining up faithfully to what the church proclaims, that that person is 
personally immoral in terms of his own behavior. But there is a correspondence. Again, two things happen when a priest is not practicing what the church preaches. Either he begins to preach what he fails to practice and then teaches falsely, or sometimes he tries to cover for himself by masquerading as if he's totally orthodox. And so what you see sometimes, and I've seen it in the clergy, is that's when people can become liturgical Nazis, as we call them in the priesthood. They can start to focus so much on liturgical orthodoxy that it more or less convinces people that they have to be with the church. And it happens liturgically more than any other area, whereas what they're trying to do is create a culture in which people don't suspect them of the types of behavior so that they can get away with some of it. And so yeah. it's an unfortunate reality. What we really have to do is, you know, I mean, I I say this in every ecclesial context, we should not be focusing far more on what behavior might be happening than we should be praying for the priests. Right. You know, we should be praying far more than we're criticizing, praying far more than we're suspecting. The vast majority of priests are good, and I have to say this for your listeners, Thomas. They might not be saints. They might not be everything Christ and his flock wants, but most priests are good. We shouldn't be paranoid about that. They're going to let us down. They're very human. They're going to let us down sometimes, but they're not double agents of Satan. They're not living double lives, the vast majority, but some are. And that's where we have to go with this. If a priest is persisting obstinately and living a double life, it's going to cause all types of havoc in the church. And this is one of the cultural things that we need to face. And since 2002, that hasn't been adequately faced, particularly with regard to obstinate sins with priests and with other priests and priests with other men. I'd like to just say, which I wrote in one of the articles, because sometimes people can say that when the church talks about homosexuality and the clergy were trying to scapegoat priests with same-sex attractions. We're not. My emphasis has always been that priests should be faithfully chaste. That's the clear expectation of the church. That's what they've promised. When priests are unfaithful in a heterosexual way with other adults, My experience has been a few things happen. If he's having a regular affair with a woman, eventually the woman wants to come out of the shadows and so gives an ultimatum, marry me or I'm out. Or she gets pregnant and he's forced to make a choice to care for her and care for the child. So a lot of the times when priests have long-standing affairs with women, they leave the priesthood. If a particular priest is unfaithful in a heterosexual way with many women serially, A lot of the times that's not going to happen at a parish level because the risk is too high. So a priest in those circumstances will unfortunately start to see prostitutes as tragic as it is and as even as disgusting as it is to talk about it. And eventually he'll get busted. Eventually there'll be a some type of scene. Maybe he'll catch a disease, all the rest of it, that either he leaves the priesthood because he's been busted or he begins to just hit rock bottom and stops the behavior. But there's not an epidemic of priests in the priesthood with long-standing heterosexual affairs. Eventually, if they go down this path, giving into the temptations of the evil one, most of them leave. And so most places, we don't have a culture of heterosexual cheaters in the priesthood. For those who are attracted in same-sex ways, most who are sinning in this way don't find an absolute incompatibility between their sinful behavior and the priesthood. They're not receiving ultimata from their homosexual lovers that they have to leave the priesthood. A lot of the times it might be other priests with whom they're engaging in this conduct. And so they're able to stay within. There's not a huge drive to get married and make an honest person of the other, etc. And so that's why it's able to fester in the priesthood. And it's able to grow as a real cancer. And that's one of the reasons why the homosexual problem in the priesthood is much greater than the heterosexual problem in the priesthood, particularly in the United States. In cultures in Africa and some places, some countries in Latin America, Chile, the homosexual problem is worse than we'll, than we'll see in almost any diocese in the U.S., as has been coming forward in the discipline that Pope Francis has been given there. 
but we need to address the problem of priests cheating on their vocation in, heter- in homosexual way in the clergy in a particular way. For me, it's we're not going after just unchaste priests with same-sex attractions. We're going against all priests who are resolutely and unrepentantly persevering in unchaste behavior, whether heterosexual or homosexual. But it's a bigger problem with the homosexual cheating than it is with the heterosexual cheating. I've always wondered why a priest who was contradicting the doctrine of the church or not living his vows would remain a priest? Is it just that it's there's some you get paid. I mean, is, is that really it? Is is that there in the in the case of homosexuality? Is it does it cover provide a mask for that kind of behavior? Or so sometimes people entered the priesthood with same sex attractions precisely to hide, to stay in the closet in a perpetual way because family right. members were always trying to set them up, etc. So sometimes people come in keeping a, in order to keep a secret. But I don't think we necessarily have to be cynical about the motivation for staying on in. What happens when anybody, and it doesn't have to be a priest, begins to live a double life is we begin to believe a lie and somehow become capable of managing the expectations because we're not living with integrity already. So holding a certain integrity of conscience when we've eclipse the conscience in terms of our own behavior is a high expectation. For people in these circumstances, a lot of the times what they say to themselves is, I'm still able to help a lot of people. I'm a very compassionate person. There are a lot of people who have been hurt by the church. I'm, you know, I really want to help people. I want to serve people. I want to give them the gospel. I happen to love Jesus. And they've compartmentalized this sinful aspect of their life. It's just unintegrated. Many occasions they start to drift further and further away from the regular practice of sacrament confession both receiving it and then giving it. They start to emphasize other areas of the faith. For example, care for the poor, care for immigrants, care for a lot of good causes, and they know that they can make a difference as a priest. It's not so much for a salary type of thing because the salary is so minimal right. that, that a, lot of, a lot of people could make a lot of money doing other things. But it is a sense that the Love for neighbor in certain circumstances begins to dominate a faithful love for the Lord. And they're able to say that because they're helping their neighbor in these ways that give them a certain pleasure in life, they're able to continue to do that type of good. And they've got this sort of hidden side to their life, which they don't think contradicts all the good that they're doing. When you look at, for example, some of what's been reported with regard to Cardinal McCarrick, you know, he was looking back and just saying, you know, so I made the mistake of kind of sharing my bed with some seminarians. It was a stupid thing to do. But, you know, he's basically saying, how could that invalidate all the good that I've done? Because they begin to become, at a practical level, proportionalists to talk about that heretical doctrine of moral theology that it's all a sum game. I'm doing more good than I'm doing evil. And they begin to believe that, okay, I'm doing all of this good. I'd have to give about I'd have to give up all of that good if I were to leave the priesthood. And so they continue to live the lie of the double life. And I think that that's how it happens. One reason I wonder about this, uh, the connection between doctrinal infidelity and other types of infidelity is that the people a lot of the, for lack of a better word, liberal priests and bishops tend to be the ones who are denying the nature of this problem and the the aspects of homosexuality or even just the the aspects of of failure to live out the promise of celibacy. So they'll use other language. They talk about the abuse of power. They talk about clericalism. Obviously, these things are a part of it. And in one of your articles, I I can't remember which one, but I'll link to all of them on the show notes page for this episode. You said, the worst forms of clericalism happen when priests forget that they are called like Christ to serve rather than be served, to sacrifice rather than receive, to share Christ's teaching rather than their own ideas. And And I do feel very abused when I'm sitting you know, as as a member of the lady, when I'm sitting through a homily that is undermining the church's teaching on marriage or or something like that, I do feel like I'm being taken and taken advantage of. I do feel like there's a, a fraud being perpetrated. So, can you talk about that? How how the abuse of clericalism and uh, the abuse of power and clericalism fit in with this, and and the the way that this is being twisted in order to 
not look at the problem in all of its dimensions. Sure. I'd like to address first that point that you were making with regard to preaching and practice. The greatest litmus test for me is whether someone is preaching contrary to church teaching in areas of sexuality. Might be preaching in other areas in a way that that is less than edifying. Might be inaccurate, for example, in exaggerating church teaching in one way or the other on the death penalty or things like this. But yeah. when people are teaching in an absolutely contrary way to the church's inheritance, treasure, with regard to the gospel of human love and the divine plan, that's when the odds go way up that the reason why they're doing it is lest they be a hypocrite themselves. They're not going to hold other people to a standard that they themselves think is impractical. The second thing, again, returning a little bit to the issue of homosexuality in this, is for someone with same-sex attractions who enters into the seminary and enters in the priesthood, he's got to be a person of extraordinary humility to believe the church's teachings, because the church teaches clearly in the catechism that same-sex attractions comes from, among other causes, an affective disorder, a disorder in our emotions. And so somebody with same-sex attractions has got to say, there's something disordered in me, not my fault in most cases, because someone was set in same-sex attractions before they made their first moral decisions before they were seven or eight years old. Not my fault. It's not a sin for me. It's a tendency towards sin, but it's not a sin to me. But I've got to accept that I've got a disorder within me. There's a temptation for people in these circumstances to say, the church is wrong about me. I'm not disordered. And if the church is wrong about me, then the church is in general wrong about the way that she approaches human sexuality. And that's where there's a huge connection between personal issues with regard to the church's sexual teaching that one doesn't really believe and that starting to preach in a heterodox way. Let's return to your question about clericalism. A lot of the times people don't know what clericalism means, so let's first define it. It's a particular type of elitism or clerical privilege that looks at the clergy as a caste that should receive special treatment, that we don't hold ourselves to the same standard as everybody else. Kind of like the blue shield and police, when police become corrupt, that they hold their fellow cops to a different standard of right and wrong and criminality and than they would everybody else. That if you happen to support the police union, you can't get a ticket, for example, if you host I mean, these are very different standards. And there have been at the worst of forms of clericalism in which there's a old boys club dressed in black with a black shield rather than a blue shield. Pope Francis has talked about clericalism quite a bit when priests don't really want to be men like Christ and serve the poor, for example, because they want to exaggerate their privilege and get special titles and special seats in synagogues, as Jesus himself would condemn in the gospel. Pope Francis says a lot of the times lay people likewise appreciate clericalism because it takes them off the hook. It's father's job to do all the rest of it. It's not my job. I'm going to allow the priest to do everything. So sometimes people, Pope Francis says, beg on their knees for clerical priests because the priest will do everything. And Jesus' whole idea is we're all on the playing field. We're all supposed to be harvesting in his vineyard because the harvest is ripe. Where it pertains to the clergy sex abuse crisis in a particular way is to the Episcopal malfeasance that has been exposed over the course of time where there was a much greater concentration in various dioceses on priests than they were on the sons and daughters of God who are being abused by these priests. And so that's one clear exercise of clericalism in the abuse case. In other circumstances, it's a clubby circumstance that begins to become corrupted that likewise needs to be addressed. When Various prelates have said that the real crisis is clericalism. I think they're only looking at one of the three problems of corruption in the church. When you go back to St. John's first letter, he talks about three forms of corruption. Materialism, which he calls lust of the eyes. Carnal sins, sexual sins, for example, which he calls lust of the flesh. And then pride of life, which are sins of power, for example. Clericalism focuses on the sins of power. 
and there clearly are abuses of power in the circumstance that need to be eradicated. But abuse of power alone doesn't talk about the materialism and all the financial stuff that has oftentimes gone with this crisis, that there's a greater concern to protect ecclesiastical assets than protect the great treasure of the children of God in the church. And likewise, it really doesn't address the problems of sexual infidelity either. And so clericalism is a part of this, but it's not the major part of this. And sometimes it's used as a red herring to divert the attention from the real problem, which is sexual immorality that is tolerated in the church. And when it is tolerated, it leads to worse abuses. There is a there is an important connection that you make as far as people giving their own ideas rather than the gospel of Jesus, insofar as and this applies to liturgy too. I mean, I I do think it's a form of clericalism uh, in a sense when a priest is making up the words to the mass instead of you know giving us the liturgy that we have a right to. Yes, it is a terrible practice of priestly pride to think they know better than the church liturgically that they know better than the Holy Spirit guiding the church to all truth, that they ultimately know better than God. No, that isn't just a priestly problem. A lot of the times the deformation of conscience in general can be that I'm going to put my own idea about the way things ought to be above what God has clearly taught in a particular area in an unmistakable fashion. That happens among lots of people. But when it happens in a priest, it's all the more severe. It happens liturgically, it happens doctrinally, it happens personally. But that's a distinct thing from clericalism. But it is one of the ways that clericalism can act itself out liturgically, doctrinally, in the pulpit, behind the altar. And then in a lot of the times, the priests who don't have the time of day for the people for whom Jesus died when they're way too busy about other things than really being present for the folks that Jesus has entrusted. No real family would be functional if a dad weren't present for his kids and his wife in the same way that the priest as a spiritual father has got to overcome the haughtiness that is present in clericalism. Priest has got to be close and he's got to be tender and he's got to be loving for his kids. And anybody who focuses on those types of virtues won't be clerical. Well, thank you, uh, Father Roger, for coming on and talking about this with us. We'll have to continue another time. Good to be with you, Thomas, and good to be with your listeners as well. Let's all pray for the church. The church needs it. We can talk a lot about this, but what the Lord really is asking of us is reparation. He's asking for action. Because the person who's most offended in all of this is the Lord himself, how betrayed he is when those he summons aren't faithful to him. But he never stops pouring out his help because we need it. Where sin abounds, as St. Paul said, grace superabounds. And as we've seen so much sin lately, especially in those who are called to teach holiness, we can be confident the Lord is going to be pouring out more graces than ever. They're there for our taking and cooperation. May you and I and the listeners be at the front lines of that response in the reform of the church that the Lord is trying to lead. Amen. If you've listened to the show before, you'll know that I usually, right after the interview, have another segment of music, after which I do a short reading of some kind. Uh, But I was just looking in the iTunes statistics for a lot of the episodes, and I noticed that a lot of people just stop listening to the show when that music comes on right after the interview. I'm guessing that maybe a lot of people aren't aware that there's a reading after that music and then the outro happens. So I think for now I'm going to stop doing that musical segment and just have the music in the intro and the outro. But if you like having that different musical segment after the end of the interview each week, or if you have a suggestion as to where in the episode I could put uh, such a musical segment where it wouldn't be confusing to people, feel free to let me know your thoughts at uh, podcast at catholicculture.org. So today's reading is from Fulton Sheen's book, The Life of Christ. As the physical body of Christ had external wounds, bruises, and scars, and yet the inner structure was left untouched, So there seemed to be a foretelling that though his mystical body, the church, would have its moral wounds and scars of scandals and disloyalties, nevertheless, not a bone of its body would ever be broken. 
Thank you, as always, so much for listening. In next week's episode, you and I both will be learning about a great American Catholic painter named Carl Schmidt. God bless. See you next week. 